Hello, Jenny Peterman. Hi, Jim. How are you Long doing? time no see. Good. Last time I think we met was in Melbourne. Uh, in that, uh, that's correct. We were talking about Sherpa. Sherpa? Yeah, which was a huge hit. Uh, you were kind enough to do a quick follow-up chat to acknowledge the fact that that film uh, had cracked, I think, a million dollars at the Australian box office. Uh after that, you made a film called Mountain, which I understand is the highest grossing Australian documentary film to date. Yeah. Yeah. Which is... No, it was a, a runaway success, which which was a surprise, right. I have to say. At the time, it was just this sort of, you know, it was a, a, a career, really creative project, and I think it somehow struck a chord with audiences, and I think it's there was no accident that it was in part due to the the fact that it was a collaboration with the Australian Chamber Orchestra who were also doing their live performances of the film and but I think it meant for cinema audiences that it gave it a sense that it was like event cinema um you know it is the, the visuals are definitely deserve to be seen on the biggest screen possible, but you have this extraordinary soundtrack and it is kind of like stepping into a concert, partly because that's how it was designed. It was commissioned by the Australian Chamber Orchestra. And so River is in that same vein. It's a it's a follow-up to Mountain. It's a, also a collaboration with the Australian Chamber Orchestra and brings together really the same creative team, um, all of the same creative team that worked on Mountain, including the wonderful narrator, Willem Dafoe. As you say... River is made in very much the same spirit as Mountain. I would argue that it's visually an even more powerful and affecting film. I describe River as the best IMAX film IMAX never made. <laughs> oh, maybe we should make an IMAX version, Jim. That's a good idea. Well, they could reprocess it and release it in in IMAX. That would be a nice idea, uh, but perhaps we can discuss that a little bit later. Just firstly, can you just mm -hmm. tell me broadly, given the success of Mountain and making this film in the same spirit, what is the response that you want from audiences? How do you want these films to resonate with people? I mean, I think we we make these films to give audiences a really immersive experience um, and to, I think, give them um, an encounter with nature. You know, I'm somebody that loves nature and grew up spending a lot of time in nature and I don't spend much time in nature these days. I spend most of my time in this desk, um, on this chair, um, doing, uh, doing Zooms and... I think it is is so important to reflect in how important it is in our life, and um, and you know, look, I'm not an activist filmmaker, um, but this film was in part also a response to what is going on in our world in in the environment, um, and it was definitely. And I'm glad you say you felt it was more affecting the mountain because rivers are more vulnerable to our harm than mountains are, and. Um, it felt necessarily, and it was a conversation we had earlier with Robert McFarlane, the wonderful writer who wrote the narration script with us, that this film needed to be more urgent. You know that that what is the state of the world's rivers is 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 not a happy story. Okay. And so um, mm. you say you're not an activist. The film is being widely described as an eco documentary, which does imply some sort of agenda. So, Jennifer Peedham, non-activist <laughs> filmmaker, do you have an agenda with this film, River? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, you know, the lives of our rivers now, as the film says, will determine the destinies of generations to come. Um, and one of the questions that the film asks the audience is, is are we being good ancestors? And... And I think that we're not, and this is a very, and there's a very specific example of where we are not and what the implications of that are, not just to climate change, but to our access to, 
to fresh water, um, which is pretty essential for human life. You certainly do, throughout the film, highlight, as you say, the fragility of rivers. In fact, many of the shots of rivers evoke a biological analogy. They look like veins or arteries. Mm. Uh, it looks like blood coursing through veins. Uh, was that part of the intention to give rivers, well, they are organic systems, but to actually give them almost a biological uh, look to them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, once you see that um, those images, you can't unsee them, and and it, it's remarkable the way that these patterns repeat themselves in nature, and and these images that you're talking about, where tied up riverbeds look like the veins of 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 um, leaves or or even trees, um, and you know, it is. I mean, it is just pretty. It's like looking at. At works of art, isn't it? Those some of those images. They're they're um, astonishing. Um, as I say, I saw it on a fairly big screen, but I think people would absolutely flock to this movie if it was in IMAX or even a VMAX screen. Certainly, with this film, the bigger the screen you see it on, the better. <laughs> two yeah, two Thanks, two big questions about the cinematography, Jennifer. How do you assemble the footage for a film like this do you have specific shots that you want to get and they send your film teams your camera teams out with the brief get these shots i want this i want that i want this aspect i want these aerial shots or do you just say look go to these locations shoot the best stuff you can bring it back and i'll sort it all out in the editing room <laughs> it's a bit of a combination. Um, one of the things that happened on this particular project was that the first day of pre-production was the first day of the lockdowns in um, in Sydney of the first lockdowns, and so suddenly we realised we weren't going to be able to go anywhere. But many of the cinematographers that we had existing relationships with all over the world also couldn't go anywhere, and um, and so we were able to to you know, commission, if you like, um, certain shots. And in some particular um, instances, we had really specific ideas, like we really wanted, a, you know, a dam shot in a particular way from particular angles and, and that kind of thing. We also really needed some underwater stuff. We're also looking for some really specific drone shots. Um, and in other cases, as was the case with Mountain, you know, I had these these. Um, cinematographers like Renan Ozturk, who I'd worked with on Sherpa and then Mountain and then River, who is out in the world shooting mountains and and um, and also, you know, natural landscapes and so rivers are a big part of that. So he had a lot of material he was able to give us and, and so we sort of continue to reach out and to different people and he put us in contact with other people he knew uh, Joseph Nazetti, the co-director on River, um, did a huge amount of research, particularly with the, the new kind of wave of amazing drone cinematographers and found guys that were doing really amazing work. And um, we made contact with them and in, it was a really, it was an unexpected delight of making the film because these guys had most of them seen Mountain and were really excited to be involved in the project and... Um, and just sort of either opened up their libraries or went and shot new material for us. And it became a kind of, you know, just a beautiful collaborative process um, with a lot of wonderful people who, who had suddenly had time available. So um, that's kind of the way that it went. How many photographers did you have out in the field shooting for this movie? Oh, you'd have to look at the credits. It's probably in the press notes, but, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot. Um and some people, it's just a few shots here or there or even just one amazing mm. shot. In other cases, um, like the cinematographer Jana Tuss-Bertrand, the French cinematographer, it's it's a lot of shots. It's sequences, um, again, with Renan Ozturk. Um, um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot and it. it was sort of wide-ranging and I think overall 
the, the material comes from about 34 well, different countries. Okay, okay. I have to ask you specifically, there is a drone mm. tracking shot in this film that is like the drone shot of the year, if not the epoch. It was yeah. it was just brilliant, so brilliant. At the previous screening, I applauded that shot. Oh, good. Now, did you? Excellent. It's just brilliant. Can you tell me just a little bit about that shot? Did you yeah. commission that shot or did you just get the file, have a look at it and go, oh, my God. So full credit to Joseph Nazetti, our, um, my co-director on that, because he, when he was deep diving into, you know, who all these young drone cinematographers were, this guy was one of the guys he, he found. His name is Rolf Hogenberg and he's Dutch. And that particular shot you're talking about was in Norway and it tracks very, very, very close to the surface of a glacier, which then plunges down a cliff, which then joins and melts and joins a river. And it is thrilling and, and Richard Tongeni paired it um, to the Bach Violin Concerto, which he then rearranged for the Australian Chamber Orchestra. And it is, you know, it is, I still get goosebumps looking at that shot with that music and it is, uh, it is a really amazing moment. That particular young guy goes online by the name of Shaggy FBB um, and he is a brilliant drone cinematographer. How did you respond when you saw that shot? I just, I, Joseph sent it to me and I said, okay, so that's in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely in the movie. And, um, and yeah, so we, we then reached out to, um, to Ralph and he was totally thrilled and also gave us some other footage and, um, you know, it was, he was one of the people that was just delighted um, to, to be included. And these guys, they just go out and they just, practice and they practice and they practice and they just get better and better. And I'm sure they crash zone drones all the time because the best drone cinematography is always that proximity flying where they're flying really close to whatever it is that they're filming and it's 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 thrilling. Well, all credit to you and to um, that gentleman for an astonishing shot. Uh, probably, yeah, probably, yeah, probably the best shot in a film full of beautiful images. So mm -hmm. beautiful in fact, uh, and the editing is just so deft that you yeah. find Simon, yeah. Yeah, you find yourself having a conversation with the film and you, you are understanding uh, implicitly what's being said by the images. Then, Jennifer Peterm, and this is a critical observation, I will put to you in all honesty, then you have the narration, which... Mm. I sensed often got in the way of the images. I'm wondering whether the film could have done without any narration at all because the visuals, the editing and the music speak so powerfully about what's going on. I would bet that there's not one thing said in the narration that you couldn't intuitively get from the images and the music and the editing itself themselves. What do you reckon? Well, I disagree. I mean, I, I I hear you because the music and the images are so strong, but as a piece of work, there is no way that we could have said all of the things that we wanted to say um, if we had no narration. And um, I think, you know, maybe some lines more so than others, but would you have known, therefore, that some of these dams that we are looking at in the film have impounded so much water that they've actually slowed the rotation of the earth which is one of the lines in the film yeah th th uh, th i agree i totally understand what you're saying um probably there's mm -hmm. like a handful of facts that mm -hmm. it, t uh, you could argue happy to sacrifice a handful of facts for the uh just for the experience of seeing it without narration i can't a bit like i guess Koyana Squatsi or Baraka, yeah. those films, those classic yeah. films, um, that's just an observation I'm making there, Jennifer. I don't think it detracts. No, it's a good one. It's a good one and I think the, the big difference here because, in fact, the original intention with Mountain was to do that without narration and the big difference is that 
Koyana Skatsi and Baraka had one cinematographer and one um, director who travelled the world and shot absolutely every frame of what was in that movie, whereas we didn't have that luxury. And um, to, to actually pull together the ideas and to ask the questions of the audience that we wanted to ask, like, you know, are we being good ancestors? Um, it, it just felt that it was, it, it was impossible to do that. But it's interesting because some people, and I, I, I totally hear you because some people respond to the words more than the music and the pictures other people um, you know, they want the music and the pictures and they don't want the words. Um, so I do find it interesting just to see the different responses to the words. I personally love them and I love Willem Dafoe's performance of them, but I, you know, it's a valid, it's a really valid point. I'm hoping, Jennifer Peden, when this thing comes out on DVD or Blu-ray or whatever, perhaps there might be an option to watch the film just with the music and have the narration as an optional extra. That's a good idea. We'll look into it. <laughs> um, thank you for putting up with that question. I, I appreciate you not oh, pulling the plug course. on me. Um, now, this film has already sold around the world, according to mm. Variety. It's already sold in uh, the United States, in Europe. I want to know, it's also sold to Russia. Hmm. Is the war with the Russian invasion of Ukraine going to impact the release of the film in Russia? It's a very good question. I don't have an answer for you because I just read that this morning when I was looking at the list of countries that have been sold to and thought, oh, that's interesting, Russia. Um, I believe Mountain also screened in, in Russia. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. Interesting to see how that plays out because um, I believe that sale happened before the war started. Um, I have another film project at the moment that's also being impacted by by the war in Russia. Um, so it's it's um, it's it's not good, but um, yeah, terrible state of affairs over there. Uh, can I just press you on that small point? What would you like? to do with the film? Would you want to suspend its release in Russia or do you think that would serve no purpose? What What's your view? Look, the, I mean, honestly, I, um, I think the point being um, we don't want any money being sent to Russia at the moment. Um, I think that's the kind of idea behind the, the, um, what do we call them? The not the quarantine. The sanctions. The, the the sanctions. Thank you. Um, so honestly, I, I just read about that this morning. So I will talk to the distributors about that. But um, I don't know. But I think there's a lot of what I do know is that there's a lot of people in Russia who are, are very against the war as well. This film um, is is doesn't speak to any of those political ideas at all. Um, and so I guess we'll. We'll, we'll wait, wait and see what happens. So what, can't give you an answer on that one. Uh, what are you working on now? What's the next thing we can expect from you? Um, hopefully the next thing that I'm directing will be um, uh, this featured drama about Tenzing Norge. Um, yeah, that's that's which is something that's been developed, um, been developing for a long time, and um, the screenplay has been written by Luke Davies, the wonderful Australian screenwriter who wrote Lion. Um, and we are, you know, getting closer and closer to, you know, having lift off on that project. And it, like all features, it's a difficult market to find that features in at the moment. Um, so there's that, and and my own production company, Strange Production Films, is is producing two features at the moment, um, which both are really fantastic young directors, and so it's been great working with them and being on the producing side, which I, I really enjoy. So um, there's lots of great stuff going on. Tenzing Norgay, of course, was the Sherpa that accompanied Sir Edmund Hillary to the top of Everest. So it's good to be working on a film that's going to correct uh, the record. For those who don't know that that mountain was conquered by two people, not one person. And in the mind of certainly one of them, it was not conquered. Um, the word conquered was not one that would enter his vocabulary that Tenzing used to 
talk about climbing Everest like um, a child climbing into its mother's lap. It should be approached with, you know, respect and love. Okay. Um, so it really does try and show um, that relationship from a different point of view.